This is 5-Minute Feng Shui Podcast 139, Children and Qi, the 7 Feng Shui Fundamentals for Children's Rooms. Welcome to the 5-Minute Feng Shui Podcast, where each week I talk about how to move energy and make money. You'll learn how to create a prosperous home and an abundant life using classical Chinese Feng Shui. I'm your host, Katie Weber, publisher of the Red Lotus Letter Feng Shui Easing for Wealth. Each week, I'll cover Feng Shui topics that can help you improve your life, share inspiring stories, and always end with three easy to implement Feng Shui tips that you can put to work right away and usually in about five minutes. Now, let's get started on the five minutes that could change your life. to you my feng shui friend we are talking today about kids oh it's just the july 4th weekend this past weekend and my son came home i'm so proud of him because he's well he's in his last summer session and of of school and he's going to be going into his last full session or semester of of college and he's a student at at um, a Texas University here, Texas Tech, and I'm so proud of him. He's just done an amazing job. But I will tell you something that made me even more proud is that we barbecued. And uh, I asked him to man the grill. And I have kind of coached him as we have um, gone along through the years on how to smoke uh, foods. And because that's a big thing we do here in Texas, you might have heard a thing or two about Texas barbecue. And especially in the central Texas area around Austin and the, the Texas Hill Country, that kind of thing. Smoking is something that was brought over with the German people that, that moved here. Uh, we were sort of like a, a second wave of Ellis Island. Actually, my, um, my father's family came through an island here that was uh, taken away from a hurricane, and uh, and that's where my my relations came from, uh, part of them on that one side. <laughs> Anyhow, so smoking food and barbecuing has just it's always been something that's been ingrained in me, and uh, something that I love doing. And I taught it to my son, and he made me so proud because his spare ribs were absolute perfection, smoked beautifully. The bones just pulled off, the meat fell off the bone. It was perfect. And I was so proud of him because I think that it's great for a young man to have certain skills. It's important. You've got to know how to cook an egg, make a steak, you know, man the barbecue, that kind of thing. I also think it's important to know how to clean a commode and sweep the floor, sew a button. Those are important skills, you know, and uh, and it makes me really proud to know that he's he's got those skills, and I taught him those, and and Tim taught him those. He's uh, Tim has taught him how to play golf, and let me tell you, just knowing that he has a lifetime of a sport that will get him outdoors and being around other people and that he can enjoy well into his old age makes me thrill beyond measure. But we're not just talking about my kiddo today. We're talking about yours. And we're talking about how to use feng shui for your kid's room. So maybe you've got a daughter or a son. Maybe you just had a baby like two of our wonderful Year of the Ox Facebook Insider Group. We have a, I have a private insider group, I call it. And uh, for the year of the ox, each year I do them. And it is a group that is just has an amazing chemistry. They're so supportive. But we had two of our members just have baby boys. And Jennifer had uh, a baby Austin and, uh, and Heather had baby Bodie. Oh, I just think they're so special. And it's I just love seeing all the baby pictures. We had uh, uh, lots of new grandmothers too, as well. So But we want to talk today about how you can use feng shui to raise happy, well-adjusted, successful, and rested, growing, healthy kids, because we can. And I don't think that, you know, we don't, nobody gives us a roadmap or a user's manual for our kids. We have to kind (laughs) of feel our way along, you know, that's, that's the old joke. No one gives you a user's manual, but... You know, I do think that feng shui gives you a manual or gives you a guidelines that you can use when decorating your child's bedroom because I really think this is a foundational thing. I know my son loved his bedrooms. He he had two and he loved them because they were arranged so that he felt secure he, and he loved his bed. He loved he had a really nice window and he really loved his bedrooms and I think it was because he felt 
comfortable in them, and it made him really secure. And uh, he's going to be getting through through uh, college here soon. So very excited about that. So let's talk about what you can do for your child's bedroom in, and use feng shui in a way that helps them have good relationships with you and your family, as well as uh, at school, and puts that focus on education, and helps them uh, be healthy, well-adjusted kids. And that really starts with the way you place their bed. I can't say enough about that. I see a lot of really bad bed placement <laughs> with when it comes to kids. And all I can say is, imagine if this were your bedroom that you're, you're decorating. Do it exactly the same way that you would do for an adult. You want to always place the bed in the command position. But I see parents who shove their kids' beds into a corner, they line them up with the door, they have them floating out in the room or uh, floating out on a wall, and it's like, who wants to sleep like that? Would you want to sleep like that? So remember that when it comes to placing your, your child's bed, it's always important that they use the command position, even an infant's bed. That's right, even a crib, you want to pull it out in the room so that so that the baby can see you. Uh, we always want to put that emphasis on, on control. And that means that that command position is always the, the wall that's opposite the door and that they can see you when you walk in. It's not in direct line with the bed. We always want to have a solid wall behind the, behind the bed and a solid headboard. Not a fan of the slatted headboards. I know a lot of folks, you know, use those, those cribs or that have the slats and then they just repurpose them into headboards. I'm not a fan of those, I got to tell you. <laughs> I see, you know, how people get sold on that. I know we, we did too, but I, I just got a, uh, a, a standard crib. Actually, it was loaned to me by a neighbor and then bought a solid headboard after that when Steve was ready to go up into a, uh, a big boy bed, as he called it. <laughs> but it's really important that they have a nice solid wall behind them, nice solid headboard. They can see the, see the door and that they don't share a wall with a toilet on the other side or a stove or, or a sink or a shower or a bathtub. You always want to make sure that you are looking at what's above their bed, what's below their bed, what's behind their bed. So, for instance, what's on the other side of the wall. Now, if it's a bathroom on the other side of the wall, that's not a problem. It's just if there is a sink or a toilet or a stove on the other side of the wall, then you want to do something to get move the bed to another wall if you can, and um, and that is just a critical critical part of of making that child feel secure. Why? Because we are so vulnerable when we sleep. And children, they feel that. They're really super sensitive to energy. So this makes it so important that we pay close attention to the way the we we position our child's bed. Now let's talk about bunk beds. I will tell you, I it's it, I'm not a fan. I know, I mean, let me rephrase that. I love them. When I was a kid and and even as a parent, I can see why they make so much sense. However, I got to tell you, it's a feng shui. <laughs> this is a feng shui podcast. So I got to tell you, they are they're not the 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 bed that you really want to have for your for your child unless you just absolutely have to. My feeling is that children really need that room to grow and that bed overhead exerts pressure on the child below. And then because there's an empty space below them, children on the top bunk can also feel less secure. So I'm really not a fan of that. I'd rather, if you have to have two kids in a room, to give them twin beds. I think that'd be a whole lot better. This is another thing that, that brings up this subject, and that is uh, that overhead pressure, and that's children under sloping ceilings. I know sometimes that's just how it is because you've got a two-story house and you've got these sloping ceilings. And if you've got an infant or a small child, even an older child, I, I've seen kids develop depression and insecurities, health problems like headaches. Uh, we, we really want to try to find a way to create a false ceiling if you, if you just absolutely have to have uh, uh, the bed underneath a sloped ceiling. Try to find a way to create a false ceiling like with a, with a canopy. Uh, that's a great way to create a false ceiling so that it looks like it's nice and solid over them because I do worry that um, that, that can create some problems. I've seen it uh, create problems. The other thing that we want to do is avoid pushing a child's bed into a corner. Let's talk about what that does. 
you literally, if you say somebody backed me into the corner, what do you, what do you mean by that? You mean that you had your back up against the wall and somebody's coming after you and you're in a defensive position. Well, when you sleep in a defensive position all the time, then the kids become defensive. They have insecurity. And sometimes I've seen it many times where kids are being bullied and dead gum if that bed isn't pushed up in that corner really important that you pull the bed out from the wall, get it out of that corner, have a solid wall. So important to try to, to make that, that, that command position work for your child's bed. The other thing that's uh, important if you've got more than one child in a room is to try to create uh, some separation and some privacy, their own kind of space. You can do that with some cartons. You can do that with canopies. You can you can do that if you're a little use a little creativity. If you can do that, that would be great. But I just can't understate the importance of how important that bed placement is, and especially putting it in, in the command position, having nice solid headboard. So important. Now let's talk about creating relationship harmony and happiness, because you know. There's nothing as miserable as an unhappy kid. <laughs> I mean, if you've ever had a kid that's pitching a fit, it just brings everybody down. And uh, and and you know, if they're if they're unhappy, you're unhappy. I heard a friend say that you're only as happy as your unhappiest child, and I think that's true. Because when our children aren't happy, it pains us. Um, that doesn't mean that we should solve every problem. <laughs> I know my my uh, son came home and my husband had to break it to him that mm, you had a problem. I think you're going to have to fix it. <laughs> Since you created it, it's all yours. <laughs> Anyhow, but but he's he's 22. He should. But when they're eight, that's a different story, right? Now, let's talk about how we can create some relationship harmony and some happiness in your child's bedroom. Now, being part of a family is such a wonderful thing. You've got those loving bonds. And I love the idea of having a picture of the family in a child's bedroom. I mean, how many bedrooms have you gone into of the parents? There are kids literally everywhere on every wall. And then you go into the child's room and there's no nothing. <laughs> There's not a picture one of the family or the parents. And this is all backwards. This is exactly the opposite of what feng shui recommends. Really, parents, take those kids out. You don't need them looking at you while you're in your bedroom, your private domain. We, you know, you're grownups. But for them, though, it's a, it, it's a feeling of security to have your photograph there and to have a photo of them and, and a photo of their family around them and have pictures of their siblings up. It's a great way to create those loving bonds. So I love that. So take them out of your, your room, parents, and put you in their room. Now, now let's talk about uh, sometimes kids can kind of um, be willful, <laughs> shall we say, or misbehave. Anyhow, my son's never done that. <laughs> But when kids are misbehaving, maybe they're having some, um, most of the time, you know, we'll talk about uh, when kids are misbehaving, some, it's usually something is coming up, maybe some insecurities or something like that. So having a picture there of you uh, and, you know, having the parents, a picture in the bedroom kind of subtly exerts to the authority of the parents to, to the child. So I think it's always, uh, it's a nice idea to, to try that if their behavior has been sort of an issue. And it also gives them a sense of more security. Now let's talk about making a balanced bedroom because we want to encourage a balanced child, right? We don't want them to be so studious that they never run outside in the sun. We also want them to be running outside in the sun and playing so much that they never crack a book. We want a balanced child. We want a kid that has uh, a full and rounded life. And so we want to think of that when we have put feng shui into focus in your child's bedroom. That means that we want to create a, a decorative harmony of elements and colors in the decor in their bedroom. So for instance, a bedroom that has a strong element like water or fire or wood, like jungle scenes, these can all create imbalances of energies and that can create difficulties for your child. So for instance, let's talk about, I see this a lot in bedrooms and especially kids with asthma. And that is the blue bedroom with the big beach or ocean mural. Um, this is way too much water energy and it can create an unhealthy environment that like I said, can lead to the respiratory ailments, 
Um, and, and this is really important, especially if your child has any kind of health or, or problems like asthma or breathing problems or behavioral problems. These can all be uh, attributed to just this overwhelm of color. Because sometimes what I see in kids' bedrooms, I like this color purple. And so everything's purple. Keep your, your color in balance. Remember, uh, it's important to keep that balance going because we want that balanced child, right? So if you, they really love that really strong purple or, or a really strong pink or whatever the color is, use it as an accent color, maybe as an accent wall. I think that's a really terrific way to do that. Let's talk about strong, strong red or primary colors. These can be really overstimulating. And too many bright colors can also prevent deep sleep, and that can affect your child's health, especially growth, because, you know, growth is stimulated by deep sleep. And this can also have an influence on their behavior as well. We really want to aim for a restful, neutral be bedroom that's more restful, but has some colored accents. This is one way to ensure the bedroom is well-balanced for both study and play and rest. And um, now let's talk about dark colors. Uh, lots of teens want those dark moody colors, but it's it's one of those things that you're just going to have to balance out, maybe as an accent color, but really we want to avoid those dark environments and choose light-filled rooms. Uh, a room should inspire and intrigue a child to learn and promote his or her sense of imagination and creativity. So that's why we want to pick out decorative items and colors and symbols that create curiosity, like a globe or a solar system mobile, something like that. I don't like the idea of having big clocks on the wall. I'm not a fan of that. It puts too much pressure on kids and Believe me, uh, aren't we all under the, the watchful eye of the TikTok? Yeah, I think we are. They don't need to, they're going to be having that <laughs> soon enough. Uh, it, it's nice if you can get through your childhood and not have the pressure of the clock. So those big clocks that I'm seeing around, like even the, the ones that go on the, you know, on the table, the nightstand type clocks or the wall clocks, let's leave those out. Uh, ferocious, scary animals, also something we don't want to have in, in there. Uh, maybe your kid loves tigers. We just don't want to have those images. Get a book with tigers <laughs> instead. I think that would be a much better choice and, and encourage reading and not have that ferocious animal on the wall. So think about those images. Choose images of role models like Olympic athletes, writers, um, maybe uh, choose maps or sports that your child is interested in. Something like that is, is going to be a more positive uh, type of decorative item. And, and lighting. So, mo so important that there's plenty of lighting, especially natural light. And you always want to have like a, a light for the desk and a bedside table. Uh, but, you know, make sure that if you do have natural lighting, which is so wonderful, that make sure that the windows can be closed off for privacy. That's really important. Just maybe some blinds that they can quickly. Uh, and don't worry about blinds. Now, I'm not a fan of the, um, oh, what are the long blinds? I'm trying to think of, but, uh, you know, if you're talking about shutters or Venetian type blinds, mini blinds, those are fine. But the ones that are the vertical blinds, there we go. I was going to say the ones that are vertical, <laughs> vertical blinds. Yeah. Those are not, uh, what we want to have in uh, a child's room. Uh, they're, they're way too big and they have too much cutting energy. All right. Well, let's talk about having that studious, uh, child. We always want to encourage study, right? And learning. So we want to create a space for study and their accomplishments. We've got to show them uh, how, a, a way that, uh, that they, can, they can study and have their own space for study. And we also want to show, all, show off all that they've accomplished. So having a dedicated space like with a desk and a lamp where your child can really study demonstrates the importance of education, but it also encourages your child's educational achievement and builds their esteem. I remember when my mom had... She had a, a sewing cabinet, and she decided to move it into my bedroom. I was so excited because it made it look like a desk. <laughs> I would sit at the desk, and I would dutifully ride and study, and I'd have my little desk lamp. And when you create that 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 space, it's amazing how it puts their focus 
toward that space. So uh, by putting in a desk or reading spot, any place where they can work and showing educational type of items there uh, is a huge help toward making the child um, f- focus toward study. Now, if you can, try to position that desk so that your child can see the door. But if they can't, uh, it's not the worst thing in the world. So don't don't stress too much. It's really important that that bed is uh, where they can see the door. Now, to build up confidence, this is we like a kid that has got good, healthy self-esteem, right? And we want to always build a confidence. And we can do that by creating a spot in their bedroom that lets them see their accomplishments. I really think that's important. You can display drawings or crafts, awards, trophies, ribbons, anything like like tests that maybe they had a good they had a good grade or letters from teachers, diplomas, anything like that. Even interests of theirs that that they're particularly good at. Why not? Uh, my son was really good in archery. And then, uh, and so we would put up some, uh, we had put up uh, some of his, uh, he had gotten some awards for archery and we put those up. Now place any items here that you have, that have brought him or her some special recognition, uh, I like medals, anything like that, trophies. When you do that, you're reinforcing that you're proud of your child's effort and it really builds up their own personal esteem and positivity. And you know, a kid that is, that's well balanced and has a good sense of self, I think is a wonderful child. That's a great thing to do. Now let's talk about, uh, having clear space. Now it's not unusual to have a kid (laughs) with a messy room and it's easy to do that. And sometimes in our society now we buy, 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 and we've got stuff, stuff, stuff. What happens is sometimes we just end up with kids that have got stuff everywhere. Now, I know my son was extremely sentimental. It was very, very hard for him to uh, get rid of anything. He just, <laughs> he, he really could not give things away. And uh, so, I, you know, I would do that. Uh, I would do that for him. <laughs> Some of the things I know that were really important to him, we definitely held on to. But work on creating clear space, clear visual space. This will enable your child to... Uh, have visual rest and and that enables them to be more creative to be more solution oriented it helps them relax more let me tell you a lot of people think that you know kids oh he, he likes to stay up till 11 or 12 at night he's never tired well you know kids actually can they actually will be more rambunctious and seem more hyper and manic when they are tired that's our that's a it's an irony that that some some folks don't know, and it is something that uh, that is that is uh, showing you that the more wound up they get, is actually the more rest they really need. And so we want to create that space where kids can rest. Now, if there's there's piles of stuff everywhere, that's not restful and relaxing. And one of the ways you can you can encourage that is encourage them to make their bed. I know that's a tall order, and I've worked really hard on my son, and and I get him to do it about ninety percent of the time. So I think that's pretty good. <laughs> and I don't, but you know, even even when he was a kid, I I, I got him to do it about ninety percent of the time, and it it's one of those things that I think it gives them a son, sense of self pride, a self uh, some a sense of accomplishment. And it's also visually restful. Who wants to get into an unmade messy bed? I don't. Even as a kid, I didn't. I always liked it when the bed was nice and made and pulled a sheet pack. And, uh, and that, it just felt better. And that clear space is, is essential for them. It's, if you can like think of this as their energetic room to grow, right? When you would go and try on shoes when you were a kid or you try on pants, you, did your mother ever like pinch your toes at the at the bottom of the f- shoe to see if there was room for your foot to grow or, or pull up your pants a little bit to see if there was a little room for you to grow into those pants? It's This is what you're doing when you create open space in your child's room is you're giving them room to grow, energetic room to grow. And that's just as important as space in your shoes and space in their pants. <laughs> So give, give your, your child's room a once over every now and then with them and you'll see them, you'll see them grow. And one of the last things I want to talk about is the importance of avoiding electronics in your child's bedroom. And this is so tempting these days, extremely tempting. I know because 
it's, it's the electronic babysitter and it makes it real easy to, to just acquiesce to them. I want to watch that, you know, and that kind of thing. It's easy to, and it's a trap. And, you know, today with so many electronics, TVs, computers, tablets, phones, in this age of technology that we live in, it's so important that children have a break from all of this with a space and a bedroom that's technology free. It's really helpful so they can really fully disconnect in the bedroom and that helps them to be more rested and that helps them to be, you know, nicer kids. And I will tell you, I know that uh, when I'm better rested, <laughs> I'm a nicer me. It just it goes without saying. It, they really need the rest because that's how they grow. That's how their brain grows. That's how their body grows is through sleep. And uh, so important that we give them an actual rest and a break from the digital world. Now, I want to talk about a couple of things that um, maybe um, if you've read my article about children and chi and the seven fundamentals, one of the things I didn't talk about in there was the importance of, of looking around your room for poison arrows. These are those sharp points, sometimes from shelves, maybe from a piece of furniture, corner of a wall, look around and make sure that you don't have uh, any, any kind of harsh points that are aimed at your child's bed. This is something that you don't think of. It's not real obvious, but if you look around and if you think, uh, or you look at your, your child's bed and you see there's a shelf that's right over their head, this is uh, not a good thing. Now, I had a a client whose daughter was a, an excellent gymnast, and she had won so many awards, but she was being plagued by these debilitating headaches. She was constantly having headaches. And one of the things I noticed was she had a rack of shelves over her bed, at the hood of her bed, and she had hung all of her medals on, on the shelf. And this shelf had very stiff points, and they were right over her head. And she also had another group of shelves on another wall and the actual corner of those shelves pointed directly at her head of the bed. And once those shelves came down, her headaches went away. It's not something that you'll see very often, but sometimes you will look around and just make certain that, it's, that there's nothing pointed at your infant or your child's uh, bed, especially the head of the bed, because this can have uh, a, an impact on them. You can also look and make sure that it doesn't cut, off, cut, cut across their feet even. Anywhere on the body, we don't want to have anything that's sort of pointed uh, at your child, especially as they're in bed, because that's where we're more vulnerable to to things like uh, unseen energies, uh, like a poison arrow, which can be from furniture or shelves or a wall, something like that. So just lo look around and take a, you know a, a really close eye to your child's bedroom to see if there are any of those those arrows that are that could be harming them. Now let's talk about colors. I touched on colors a few moments back, and this is one of those things that we think children need really bright colors, and that is one of the misnomers that I see frequently. There was uh, one child who had a, a wall of each bedroom was painted in a primary color. It was red, bright red, bright green, bright yellow, bright blue. Now think about that. Would you ever want to sleep in a bedroom like that? Look at what you are putting up in your child's bedroom and think about that as an adult okay maybe i don't i don't care for that shade of pink or that that color of of blue but look at the pattern look at the busyness of it if, is it too busy is it too bright we often will do things in a child's bedroom that we would never ever think of doing in, in an adult's bedroom. And I'm not saying that we should make little adults, but I'm saying keep within reason when you're looking at a design that is going to be the place where your child is rested and grows and accomplishes in their life and, and is a a source of happiness for them. I know when uh, when and Tim and I uh, had Stephen, one of the things we we did was we used wallpaper and colors that were not considered baby colors. 
And the reason why is we felt like we really wanted him to have a room where he would fully, fully rest and that he would be very comfortable in and that he could sleep well in and that he was relaxed in because that to me was his primary job as an infant was to rest and sleep and grow and let his little brain develop. So even though you have a child, that doesn't always mean that you have to use childish colors or childish designs. I think there's still a way to create a child's room without having to uh, resort to using colors that are something out of a, um, a crayon box. <laughs> Not that I don't love crayons. I love crayons. But you want to make sure that whatever it is that you're putting in your bedroom is something that you would be comfortable in too as an adult. So if it's too busy, too wild, too graphic, too too colorful, too bright, too loud visually, it's going to be too loud for your child. Even though we think that they are able to withstand all of these bright colors and all these busy images, they really have sensitive energy. They're very sensitive to what's around them. And I think, you know, they can have all the colors and, and play items that they want outside the bedroom. But when they're in the bedroom, we want them to be able to be calm and be able to study if they need to study or rest if they need to rest. So think about those those colors and, and the designs that you're putting in. And while while we love color, sometimes in kids' room, there's a thing, I would call it oversaturation. We want, just want to make sure that we harmonize and balance those colors and those designs and graphic elements when, when we're designing our kids' rooms. All right, well, I want to leave you with three tips for today for your kids' rooms and making feng shui that is going to help them be happy, healthy, and grow. And that is number one is put that bed in the command position. Always make sure that your child can see the door. Avoid that pushed up in the corner kind of situation, floating on a wall, that kind of thing. Make sure they're in the command position and they can have a nice solid wall behind them and a nice solid headboard. Tip number two, let's go for the balanced bedroom because it creates balanced kids. We can have some bright colors and pops of color and cheerfulness in the, in the bedroom, but we don't want uh, just a, a room that is a wash and all things purple or pink or red or green or whatever that is. A, a, having a child in a jungle scene room where it's murals all the way around, and I have seen that, is is uh, it's really not helpful for their for for sleep and actually plants are not great motifs for children uh, just so you know anyway um, and so look for that balanced bedroom in terms of design in terms of color and the decorative objects and symbols that you put in there really be thoughtful about that lastly. No electronics. Tip number three, to pull the plug in the bedroom. It's just not the place where your kiddos need to have anything with an on button. It needs to be a book, a lamp, something like that. And, uh, and it'll help them rest and be more attentive, more awake, more alert, and, and more, uh, more of a great kid in every day when you get up. All right. Well, there you go. The seven ways to help you uh, feng shui your child's bedroom. I hope this was enlightening for you. I wish you good luck because you know what? They, those kiddos, they need our attention and they need a bedroom that supports them. You have a great week and I'll talk to you next week on 5-Minute Feng Shui.